Because of the following special program, Maud, All's Fair, and the Sonny and Cher Show will not be presented this evening. Welcome to another episode of the following special presentation. The only series on this website that looks at the most hilariously cheesy TV movies ever made. I don't know about you, but I've been feeling kind of a chill lately. Maybe it's fall, maybe I'm dying. Either way, I think it's good time for a horror film. In fact, I can think of just the one. In fact, it even has horror right there in the title. I give you the horror at 37,000 feet. The year is 1973. Two types of films are doing big business at the box office. On the one hand, you have disaster-themed films like Airport and The Poseidon Adventure. On the other hand, you have satanic-themed films such as Rosemary's Baby and The Exorcist. So what's a CBS programming wizard to do? <laughs> Combine the two, of course. You got your horror film in my disaster movie. You got your disaster movie in my horror film. Yes, in this TV movie, a group of D-list actors are passengers on an airplane, possessed by demons. I know, I know, this already sounds like a surefire hit, but the real genius of this movie is that one of those passengers is William Shatner. At the time, it had been a few years since Star Trek was canceled, and Shatner was taking pretty much every role he could get. But believe me, he really gives it his all here, and single-handedly makes this film a work of art. You know all about these things. You were a priest, weren't you? What can we do? <laughs> you don't want a priest, Mr. Friley. You want a parachute. At the start of the film, a plane is departing from London's Heathrow Airport, carrying our cast of cliches. I mean, characters. And like any great disaster movie, we get to meet each character one by one, giving us ample opportunity to take bets on who gets killed off first. Meet... The Cowboy Movie Star. Meet Barnaby Jones. Meet the Asian fashion model, played by the Alain of Troyes herself, Franz Nguyen. I did not give you permission to leave. I didn't ask for any. Meet the cute little girl traveling alone. You can just assume she has some sort of terminal disease. Meet... The Stylish Doctor, played by Paul Winfield in a pimp hat. He was on Star Trek, too. Darmok and Gillard at Tanagra. Meet the millionaire and his wife, the professor, and Marianne. Actually, the last part is not a joke. The movie features Russell Johnson, the professor from Gilligan's Island, in a small role as a flight engineer. And yes, I know what you're thinking. And yes, as a matter of fact, they are on a three-hour flight. A three-hour flight. But this isn't just any flight. This flight is carrying satanic cargo. And how do I know it's satanic cargo? <laughs> From the satanic noises, of course. Cool. What was that? Can't worry about it now. Yeah, sorry to say, the time to deal with demons from hell was back at luggage check. But the good news is, the way airlines handle our luggage these days, those demons are bound for Trinidad. But the presence of the cargo does lead to some spooky things, such as spontaneous cold snaps. And what happened? I don't know. Don't worry, there's a reasonable explanation for why those guys just saw ice magically appear on the cockpit window. You see, back in those days, it was okay for the pilots to get a little drunk before the flight. Damn, FAA ruins everything. Eventually, we meet a passenger who's going to be the highlight of this movie. William Shatner. Here he plays Gene Hackman playing a disillusioned priest in The Poseidon Adventure. And clearly, there's only one thing a disillusioned priest is dying to do once he gets out of the frock. Get completely stinking drunk. Okay. But in Shatner's case, it's understandable, given he's stuck traveling with a female companion who busts out the guitar on long flights. You know, this sounds a little off. Naturally. Closer to heaven, 
for more discordant. Jeez, I think somebody's bitter. Come on, Bill, don't be a savior hater. Eventually, we learn the satanic cargo is actually an altar taken from an ancient abbey and is being flown from England to New York by Mr. and Mrs. O'Neill, our obligatory bickering couple. You know, I think maybe I'm going to put some black stone on the floor here around the altar. Very nice if you're planning to use it for a bar. <laughs> That's a little nasty, isn't it, dear? There's also some crazy British lady named Mrs. Pinder who's on the flight only to harass the O'Neills. Mrs. O'Neill, I cannot believe that you would acquiesce in the uprooting of these priceless relics. Please, leave me out of it. That's right, she's following them all the way to America, simply because she believes removing the Abbey from England is pure sacrilege. 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 Uh, yeah, that's what I just said. So I believe the obvious conclusion that we can all draw here is that the Abbey is possessed by demons. You really don't know what's down in that hole, do you? To be honest, no, but I'm hoping it's more of those little bags of peanuts because this is a long flight and I'm starving. And so while Hubby's off having a drink and flirting with Franz Nguyen in the first class lounge, the wife starts to get a sense that strange things are afoot, mostly when she hears horrifying noises in her headphones. That's right, it appears the demons from the Abbey have somehow worked their way into the airplane's Muzak system. But hey, enough with the passengers. Let's meet the pilot, played by Chuck Connors, the manliest man to ever manly his man on TV. I mean, come on, he was Rifleman. The Rifleman. Seriously, he's so manly his parents should have named him Cock Connors. Ooh, am I allowed to say that on the internet? So Chuck discovers the plane is stuck in a mysterious headwind, so he turns the plane around only to find out they're still stuck in a mysterious headwind. Cornwall Center, AOA 19 X-ray, confirmed squawk setting at Alpha 2100. We have your blip 19 the devil are you doing up there flying in circles? Yeah, what the bloody hell are you doing up there, you bollocks wankers? Oh, wait, am I allowed to say wankers on the internet? So it appears the plane is just kind of hanging there, suspended in midair, I guess. It's a problem. Like what? It seems as if we're caught up in this crazy kind of a jet stream. It's as, as if we're hung up here on a hook. What does that mean? A hook. It's a piece of metal bent into a curve. But that's not important right now. Naturally, the first passenger to notice their strange predicament is Shatner. Peculiar. Ugly illusion. Motionless. Suspended. I run like a nowhere. Actually, I think he's just pissed there's not a man on the wing of the plane. The last time that happened, it was a blast. Cause she was so amazing, and now my heart is breaking. But I just keep on saying. Baby, 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 oh, baby. But we already know why all this is happening. There's something very evil in the cargo hold, and whatever it is, it wants out. Come on, what do you want? If you know a better way to ship illegals into the country, I'm all ears. Hey, all those kids aren't going to au pair themselves. At about the same time, Mrs. O'Neill has a little seizure, collapses on the ground, and starts speaking in tongues. This should be entertaining. Uh, I think we're going to need a translator on that. Uh, Paul Winfield, could you help us out here? Darmok and Gilad at Tanagra. <laughs> okay, thanks. That clears everything up. But the freaky events keep coming. A stewardess notices the cargo hold is freezing cold and goes to investigate, but ends up getting trapped in the plane's elevator. It's just your run-of-the-mill airplane elevator accident. Yeah, you know how it is. Every time I open up the newspaper, it's another airplane elevator accident. Well, obviously those silly weak girls can't be trusted to get to the bottom of things, so it's up to Captain Chuck and the Professor to head on down to the cargo hold to take a look around. Not the do 
dog! No! Man, they killed off the dog. That really sucks. Am I right, Professor? Professor? The professor? No! Bummer. And just as he was about to figure out a way off the island, too. Jim. He's dead. No, no. I'm sorry. The actual line is, he's dead, Jim. Now, let's hear you do some spot quotes. Please don't mention anything that's happened. We must avoid a panic. The flight engineer has been killed. Okay, so what's the in-flight movie? Well, the passengers are just a little disturbed to find out a crew member is dead, but what really gets them all freaked out is when strange substances start gushing up through the carpet. Oh, come on, guys, haven't you had airline coffee before? Actually, come to think of it, that's more along the lines of what happens after you drink airline coffee. But the less said about that, the better. Moving on. Well, it's about here that all hell really breaks loose as the passengers are menaced by a ghostly wind as well as an evil curtain. Eventually, it's time for Mrs. Pinder to come clean about exactly what's going on around here. The Abbey was built on a sacred grove of the Druids, a place where they committed human sacrifices to the ancient gods of darkness. Yeah, 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 sacrifice, blah, 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 Druids. But why is this happening tonight? And every hundred years, at the summer solstice, they still... It's Summer's Eve. Paul, you said that was tonight. For all I know, it's Halloween. Oh, you'd know it, Bill. Mainly by all the people wearing masks that look like you. For a brief moment, the movie makes you think they're going to sacrifice the girl. But no. Turns out to be a total fake out. No! Please! Perhaps we could offer it this. You mean like voodoo? You want to offer the doll instead of... My God, that's hideous! Instead, the passengers decide to offer up the girl's doll as a sacrifice. Which, for some reason, involves first making the doll really pretty. Great idea, because clearly the best way to scare off demons from hell is by giving them their own Tammy Faye Baker doll. <laughs> Unfortunately, the doll thing doesn't work out either. Just in time for Christmas, it's the Betsy Pukesy doll, the only doll with lifelike symptoms of bulimia. No, but seriously, ladies, if you ever find yourself with bulimia of the eyeball, it might be time to admit you have an eating disorder. Luckily, this movie takes place in a time when you could still smoke on airplanes. Ah, yes. A golden age when you could handle an open flame inside a pressurized tube of oxygen. Of course, this leads to a breakthrough epiphany for Shatner. A fire. Mrs. Pender, is that it? No. Actually, Bill, I believe she just caught a whiff of your cologne. Or perhaps the glue that's holding down your hairpiece. Strong stuff. Yes, a fire. So the passengers decide that the best way to drive the demons away is to build a bonfire right in the middle of coach. Sounds like a great idea to me. Actually, this isn't a scene from the movie. It's real footage of what happens after a plane sits on the runway for 12 hours waiting to be cleared for takeoff. I mean, come on! Where were you people when that guy from Nigeria was trying to set his underwear on fire? Screw you, Jonas Brothers! I'm totally over you and your stupid coloring books! And that's when all hell really breaks loose, with white guys grappling in the aisle, Shatner fighting with an eight-year-old girl, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria! But eventually the passengers put their differences behind them and decide the best way to defeat the demons is to wait until sunrise. I asked you, when is the sunrise? 3.42 out here. I wouldn't count on seeing it. Well, maybe we could climb to meet it. Catch it early as it comes over the rim of the world. Now what is this rim of the world jazz? We climb, we burn more fuel. Coincidentally, rim of the world jazz was the name of an ensemble I was in back in high school. <laughs> we totally rocked the Dave Brubeck. They wait for sunrise, but Shatner can't resist the sweet siren call of all that pure evil done in the cargo hold. 
So he goes down to personally investigate the Haunted Abbey. Basically, he digs around for a while until we get to the best moment of the movie. Or of any movie. In fact, why am I talking to you right now when you could be watching the best moment of the movie? Thank you, movie gods. Can we see that again, please? Well, there's actually some good news here, because in the event of a water landing, Shatner's ego doubles as a flotation device. Immediately after this, the survivors finally see the sunrise, and just like that, the demons are gone. The plane lands, the end. No, seriously, the ending really is that abrupt. I guess they blew their load on Shatner falling out of the airplane and figured, well, nothing could possibly top that. And they were right. Despite some hilarious moments, the horror at 37,000 feet is overall a pretty forgettable TV movie. Thanks to broadcast standards, TV movies can never really be that scary. And when you have a special effects budget that's less than the price of a Happy Meal, including the toy, it's pretty much impossible to depict any kind of real disaster. So ultimately, it fails as a horror movie and fails as a disaster movie. Well, that about does it for me. You be safe out there, kids. And always remember to watch out for grown men drinking booze out of Disney princess tea sets. We now return you to The Law and Harry McGraw, already in progress. sacred grove of the druids a place where they committed human sacrifices to the ancient gods of darkness no one knows who they were or what they were doing